All right, we are almost ready to go. It's, al it's almost f five past five. Uh, should I give you a heads up to start? We can start, we are already online. Okay, fantastic. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Luca Belli. I'm professor at FGV Law School, where I direct the Center for Technology and Society. And together with a group of friends, many of whom are here with us today, we have decided to create this uh, group, this coalition within the IGF called the Data and AI Governance Coalition, where, as you might imagine, we will discuss, we are discussing already uh, data and AI governance issues, and with a particular focus from the Global South perspectives. So with the idea to create this group was born some months ago during a capacity building uh, program that we have at FGV Law School. It's called the Data Governance School at TAM, which is itself the a sort of academic spin-off of a conference we host, CPDP LATAM. You might already you might know the European one. There is also a Latin American one uh, that we host in Rio every July. And uh, so after these three days of intense discussions on data governance and AI in, uh, in March, uh, actually in April, at the end of April, uh, we figured out that it was good to keep on uh, maintaining this very good interaction we had and even try to expand them to bring new voices with, because one of the main, uh, let's say, critiques that emerge is that frequently these discussions about data governance and AI have a novel representation of uh, global north, if we can say so, uh, ideas and solutions and, and the severe underrepresentation of Global South ideas and uh, uh, concerns and even solutions sometimes. So the idea was precisely to start to discuss how to solve this and as many of us uh, have a research background or are interested in doing research, we decided to draft this book that we managed to uh, organize and print in record time. But I, I have to, to, to also to disclaim that this is a preliminary version. So if you uh, want actually to give us feedback on how to improve it, or in case anyone is uh, interested in proposing uh, some additional very relevant uh, uh, perspective we, we might have, we might have uh, missed, for instance, we know that uh, the only uh, region that is still a little bit poor in, our, in the book is Africa. Uh, the others are very well covered. Uh, and uh, we are going to actually, we also created a form. If you tape in your browser bit.ly slash DAIG, like data and AI governance, DAIG 23 in capital letters, you will arrive directly on the form where you can also download for free this book. If you are allergic to Google Forms, which is something that may absolutely happen, you can even use another mini URL, uh, bit.ly slash dig2023, where there is the direct downloading option of this from the IGF website without having to fill any form on comments. But if you want to create, to provide us comments, actually we are here to, to hear them. Uh, the book is, uh, deals with three main issues, AI sovereignty, AI in transparency, and AI accountability. I'm not gonna delve into the transparency and accountability part because we have a very large uh, set of very good speakers that will mm, explore the various details of, of these topics from very different perspectives. Uh, I'm just gonna say two words on the first topic, AI sovereignty, which is actually an application and an implementation of what uh, I have been working with some colleagues from another project, the CyberBricks project, reg with regard to digital sovereignty over the past years, and the uh, fundamental uh, teachings of the past years have been of two types. First, there are a lot of different perspectives on digital sovereignty. Uh, you may, a lot of people see this as authoritarian control or protectionism, but also there are a lot of other perspectives, including uh, ba those based on self-determination, and the fact that both states or local communities or individuals have the right to understand how technology works, develop it and regulate it, and there is nothing authoritarian in all this, and actually it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a right 
of all peoples in the world according to Article 1 of the not only the, the Charter of the United Nations, as we are in now the United Nations context, but also the International Covenant of Political and Civil Rights and the International Co Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. So it's a fundamental right of everyone here to, uh, to, be, to be the master of your own destiny, if you want, in terms both of uh, uh, social rights, governance, but also technology. And so the, the, the fundamental reflection of the first part of this book is about about this, how how do you how do you achieve this? And uh, in in the chapter I I've authored, I, I identify what I call the key AI sovereignty enablers. That are key eight key elements that goes from they, they form a stack, an AI sovereignty stack. They go from uh, data, so you have to understand how, how data are produced, harvested, how to regulate them. Uh, so data, you have algorithms, you have compute. You have connectivity, you have uh, uh, cybersecurity, you have electrical power, because <laughs> some, something that many people don't understand is that if you don't have power, you cannot have <laughs> AI at all. You have to have capacity building, which is sort of transversal. And last, but of course not least, you have to have AI governance framework based on risks, which are the main thing that we are actually trying to regulate. But I think that we, if we only regulate AI through risks, we only look at the tree and we miss the forest because there are a lot of other elements that interact and they are interrelated. So that is, the, in a nutshell, the first chapter. Uh, I was very honored to have Melody and uh, her co-author, Cizwes Nile, that was the former, one of the former directors of the uh, South African regulator to uh, draft a reply on this, to, on this framework with regard to South Africa. Another, there is another one with regard to India, and then we, there are a lot of other very interesting uh, issues analyzed by our uh, distinguished speakers of today. Uh, so without uh, missing any uh, more time, uh, I would like to pass the floor for the, to the first speakers. We have in this first slot of speakers, we have some more uh, general perspective. Then we delve into the, the generative AI part, and then we delve again. We uh, we zoom out into other uh, transparency and accountability, more general uh, issues. So uh, I would like to pass the floor to Armand. I'm not going to list all the speakers now. I will present them each one by one because there are a lot. So first we have Armando Mazueta, that is uh, Director of Digital Transformation at the uh, Ministry of Economy of the Dominican Republic. Please, Armando, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Luca, for the presentation. Um, I'm more than thrilled uh, to be present here and to share with you uh, some important insights regarding AI and how governments, uh, for example, are trying to use AI, specifically Gen AI, to modernize their infrastructure and the uh, provision of public services. Well, um, how to begin with this? <laughs> well, a uh, few technologies have taken the world by storm uh, the way AI has over the past few years. That's something that's a reality. Uh, not even the blockchain revolution uh, had, had had this much impact on, on the world as AI had. And, um, and its many use cases have become a topic of public discussion, not just for the technical community or the so-called tech bros, but also, but say, all people has, uh, has been discussing on how to implement AI one way or another. And um, generative AI in particular uh, has a tremendous potential to transform society as we know it for good. Uh, give our economies a much needed productivity boost and generate public and private value, potentially in the trillions of US dollars in the coming years. Well, the value of AI is not limited to advances in industry and retail alone. When implemented in a responsible way, where the technology is fully governed, data privacy is protected, and decision making is transparent and explainable, AI has the power to usher a new era of public services. Such services can empower citizens and help restore trust in public entities by improving work for workforce efficiency and reducing operational costs in the public sector. On the back end, AI likely has the potential to supercharge digital modernization in by, for example, automating the migration of legacy software to more flexible cloud-based applications or accelerating mainframe applications modernization, which is one of the main issues most government has. Despite the many potential advantages, um, many governments are still grasping on how to implement AI and Gen AI in particular. In many cases, public institutions around the globe face a choice. They can either embrace AI and its advantages, tapping into the technology potential to help improve their li the lives of the citizens they serve, or they can stay on the sidelines and risk missing out on AI abilities 
to help agencies more effect effectively meet their objectives. Government institutions early thought up solutions leveraging AI and automation offer concrete insights into technology's public sector benefits, whether modernizing the tax collection system to avoid fraud and predict trends, or using automation to greatly improve the efficiency of the food supply and production chain, or to better detect uh, diseases before, the, before they occur and prevent major outbreaks, such as the pandemic that we had before. Other successful AI de deployments reach citizens directly, including virtual assistants and chatbots to provide information to citizens across many government websites, apps, and messaging tools. Getting there, however, requires a whole government approach focused on three key main areas. The first one is workforce, workforce transformation, or digital labor. At all levels of government, from national entities to local governments itself, public employees must be ready for this new AI era. While that can mean hiring new talent like data scientists and developers, it should also mean providing existing workers with the training they need to manage AI-related projects. The goal is to free up time for public employees to engage in high-value meetings, creative thinking, and meaningful work. The second major focus must be citizen engagement. For AI to truly benefit society, the public sector must need to put people in front and center when creating new services and modernizing the existing ones. There is potential for a variety of uses in the future, whether it's providing information in real time, personalizing services based on particular needs of the population, or hastening processes that have reputation for being slow. For example, anyone here has ever to fill paperwork or has to suffer doing impossible lines or queues just to receive a documentation or have to, that must be repeated in, at several institutions just to receive the same service that, the, the, that they need. And um, the thing is, most of the governments, for example, don't have the interoperability or, or any sort of services just to exchange information freely. And it's something that with AI and other related infrastructures, we could, so that's something that we could be uh, solving very quickly. Uh, the third one is the government platform modernization. And governments are regularly held back by true transformation by legacy or ancient systems that are tightly coupled uh, with workload rules that require substantial effort and cost to modernize. For example, public sector agencies can make better use of data by migrating certain technology systems to the cloud and infuse it with AI. Also, um, AI-powered tools hold the potential to help with pattern, decision, uh, pattern detection sorry, in large stores of data and be able to write applications. This way, instead of seeking hard to find skills, government institutions or agencies can reduce their skill gap and tap into the evolving talent. Last but not least, no discussion of responsible AI in the public sector is complete without emphasizing the importance of the ethical use of the technology throughout the life cycle, design, development, use, and maintenance, something uh, which most governments have promoted in the, for years, to put it simply along with uh, many organizations that belong in the healthcare industry or the financial sector, for example, government and public sectors must strive to be seen as the most trusted institutions because it holds most of the citizens' data one way or another. So if the citizens doesn't trust the governments, how they can even trust the, uh, well, the, all, all the institutions that exist in the, in the same nation? That means uh, that humans should be able to continue to be at the heart of the services delivered by government while monitoring for responsible deployment by relying on these five core aspects for trustworthy AI. Explainability, fairness, transparency, robustness, and last but not least, privacy. When we talk about explainability, it means that an AI system must be able to provide a human interpretable explanation for its predictions and insights for, to the public in a way that does not hide behind technical jargon. Um, in government, there are many trends and many conversations regarding uh, algorithmic transparency because it, what is, it, what, that is the major aim, to reveal what's in the black box and so for everyone to see how an AI system works and how, did it, it, how it was built. So, we understand how it provides this insight and how it, and how it develops, and how it deploys and how it functions. The second one is fairness, that an AI system ability to treat individuals or group equitably, depending on the context in which AI system is used, countering biases and addressing discrimination related to protected characteristics such as gender, race, age, and, better, and other status. Transparency. 
an AI system ability to include and share information on how it was being designed and developed and what data from which sources have fed the system. It's something that I as previously mentioned in, with explainability, which is something that is closely related to it. Robustness, an AI system must be if it must be able to effectively handle exceptional conditions, such as, as abnormalities in input to guarantee consistent outputs. And last, privacy is basically the ability to prioritize and safeguard consumers' privacy and data rights and addressing existing regulations in data collection, storage, and access and disclosure, which is why it's important that uh, besides implementing AI, we also should be consistently improving, modernizing the frameworks that entice us everything related to data protection. Because if we don't have those rules in place, uh, there is the possibility that many people, not just in the private sector, but also the government, use the data that is stored in the government databases to do harm, to use it as a political weapon, and many other things. So it's important that we have strong data protection rules in place so the data isn't used against the same citizens that the government is there to protect and to serve. Uh, just to conclude, uh, if AI is implemented Amanda, in a way... to conclude quickly? Because okay. Uh, we have yeah. okay. <laughs> okay, just a quick conclusion. Uh, if we implement AI, including all the traits mentioned above, it can help both governments and citizens alike in new ways. We can generate public value, but in a way that allows all the citizens to benefit from it and to build a future that we all want to live in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Armando. And uh, thank you very much for giving us this initial inputs on what is the idea that governments should strive for when they have to automatize their system and implement AI. Uh, and now I would like to give the floor to Gmenga uh, that might have a more critical perspective and less ideal. Uh, and it's very good to have both this perspective to, uh, to try to synthesize uh, our own opinion. Please, Gmenga. It's like you framed my conversation already. <laughs> um, I'm glad we're having a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, conversations around AI. Uh, this is my second panel on AI today. Thankfully, this is more focused on generative AI and, and data protection. But I think one of the advantages of having such conversations over and over is that you get to tease out all the points uh, and ask the questions. Um, and wh what I want to do is to very quickly, so that you don't have to say I should conclude, <laughs> uh, I want to speak very quickly to three things. Uh, one is in terms of policy, the other is in terms of people, and I will, you know, if, if I have more time of my six minutes, I'll conclude on practice. Uh, and, and by policy, I, I, I mean that we already, in many cases, have data protection, you know, regimes in, in many countries. Uh, there are countries that still don't have data protection, you know, regulation. Uh, of course, this presents an opportunity for them to have this conversation within the context uh, of, of massive, you know, data collection and processing, uh, you know, for, for AI. Uh, but for those who have, it means that this is also a chance to have a review. Uh, and I say this, you know, uh, as an African uh, who is excited that now, finally, the Malabo Convention uh, has, has been ratified by as many countries, so it's in force, uh, but also concerned that it happened so late that the Malabo Convention, the text of the Malabo Convention is, to say the least, outdated. Uh, you know, uh, and of course, there have been calls for reviews. There are countries that are literally just ignoring, uh, you know, the fact that they have, uh, you know, more recent policies on, on on the subject. So I think, in terms of in terms of policy, we need to have a conversation about how to make sure that existing data protection policies are useful as we have this conversation about massive data collection and processing. Uh, you know, people are putting in their data, uh, you know, it's being processed. And that takes me to my second point of people. Th uh, you know, uh, I work in civil society, and that means that much of my work is centered on people. Uh, and it means that when we have all these conversations uh, over the last year, I mean, we uh, November 30, oh, actually, well, it's just a month away. So November 30 is the birthday of uh, chat GPT, uh, as everyone knows. So it's been one year. Uh, and there's, there's been a lot that's happened uh, since then. But at the center of all this is people, the data owners themselves. Uh, I'll give a very simple example. When chat GPT came, a lot of people, you know, were just typing and 
and type in. Because don't forget, many times, the reason why people engage with either social media or new platforms or new technologies the way we do is that for many people, it's literally magic. Uh, you know, you put in where you're going and then the map tells you how to get there and it tells you there's going to be traffic and it's almost like magic. But the problem is that many times, because people don't understand that when they put in their data, that's the input that has been processed. The output is what you get, but the input is also important. So I think in terms of people, we need to have a conversation around uh, demystifying AI, uh, which is one of the reasons I'm glad we're having all these conversations uh, over the last uh, two or three days for people to understand, you know, uh, when, when I put in data, I'm training the system. Uh, when I, you know, and ask questions, the re you know, the re response I'm getting is based on what input has already been given. Of course, uh, that goes to the need for, and we talked about that a bit earlier today, uh, that in modeling uh, AI, we need to make sure that diversity, and this is, this is not about tokenism, this is real diversity. Otherwise, we're going to build systems that don't uh, understand context and going to cause more problems uh, than, than solving things. And finally, uh, it's, on, it's on practice. And I think this is where, this is where you know, the data protection commissions come in. Uh, hopefully, data protection commissions that are independent already understand the need to have conversations uh, with various stakeholders. And the practice is, if, what, what happens if something goes wrong when I'm using uh, you know, uh, any platform or system that is powered by artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, uh, someone shared an article with me a few days ago. Uh, it was supposed to be an article about myself, uh, but I read the article and I was confused uh, because at the beginning it was accurate and then it gave me a master's degree that I don't have from a school I haven't attended. Uh, and then it said I was on the UNI level uh, panel on digital cooperation, which is very close because uh, you know, I'm on the IGF leadership panel, but not the one on digital cooperation. And, and this, this, is, this is quite tricky. Uh, and, and this, by the way, is, is, is you know, one area uh, of, of criticism from, from me to say that uh, what happens when I use this and something goes wrong? Who do I talk to? And I think this is one uh, place where people, institutions that already answer questions with data protection uh, can come in. So I'll, just, I'll, I'll, I'll close it here. Uh, and say that it's really important that we center this on people. Uh, but apart from you know saying that, there's there's a need to you know review policy when necessary. People are the center of this. And when it comes to practice, what do I do when something goes wrong? Who do I talk to? We need to demystify you know this black box. Fantastic, Ben. Uh, I really like the, this trilogy of uh, policy, people, and practice. Actually, when, while you were speaking, I was thinking that. In the best case scenario, in most country, we are some sort of po we have some sort of policy, but the people part is almost inexistent. Even in the most in the country that have data protection, for instance, for 50 years, like in Europe, most of people would not be aware of their rights, let alone in developing in the developing world. And the practice part is still, still something pretty much uh, non-existent everywhere. All right, on this initial. Uh, energy and optimism. Let's uh, get to the, to, to the uh, third speaker of this first uh, round, Melody Muzoni. Please, Melody, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Luca. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Luca. Um, I'm happy that uh, you are bringing these issues around uh, data protection and how uh, laws and how that uh, can help with regulating. AI, and I've been following a couple of uh, discussions around um, AI policy and regulation, and I keep on wondering, like, what exactly do we want to regulate here? Because when we look at law, it is quite vast. There are different areas of law. Are we looking at it from a delict perspective, delictual liability, criminal liability? Are we looking at, at intellectual property issues, data protection? There is a myriad of issues that um, I think when we have these discussions around AI policy and regulation, we need to keep that at the back of our minds on what exactly do we want to regulate? Are we regulating the industry, the industries? Are we regulating the types of partnerships that we may end up uh, having? Or it's just going to be specifically data protection? And I'm sure some of our speakers will speak on the limitations that we have with data protection uh, laws. And coming to um, um, my section on the chapter we wrote on South Africa, what we did was we looked at uh, the case framework that um, 
Lucas spoke about earlier, looking at how these key AI enablers can actually apply within the South African uh, framework, and uh, hopefully that can also be replicated across uh, Africa and other African countries. And I'm just going to touch on four uh, important uh, key findings from the research that we have already uh, conducted for South Africa. And uh, the message that we are getting throughout is that uh, there is uh, the need for AI made in Africa to solve African problems. So when you go through some of the policy frameworks at the African Union uh, level, for example, the digital transformation strategy, looking at the data policy framework, that is the message we keep uh, getting across that uh, there is that urgency for Africa <laughs> to start looking into AI and innovation to actually develop um, African uh, solutions or homegrown solutions to deal with um, African problems. And then uh, the second second uh, key point I want to emphasize in looking at South Africa is the issue of uh, computational capacity and uh, data centers and building the data in cloud market um, in Africa. So you understand, of course, that uh, with AI development, uh, it would depend more on the availability of computing infrastructures to host, to process, and to use data. And with South Africa, uh, what we have noticed is that there are efforts to actually improve on its computational capacity. There have been discussions about having as many data centers uh, within the country as possible. The private sector, the likes of Microsoft, Amazon, they have been actually uh, working closely together with government to make sure that there are data centers on the continent, so uh, uh, in, uh, in South Africa. So the vision for the country is not just to have data centers in South Africa to cater for businesses and government uh, in South Africa, but also to become uh, a host or to attract other um, African countries to actually host their data uh, within uh, South Africa. And um, there was a draft policy that was published sometime in 2020 called the National Data and Cloud Policy. And that uh, policy seemed to actually point towards um, a direction where South Africa wants to locally uh, own, uh, to make sure that uh, locally owned uh, entities are active in the data market and promoting our local processing and local storage of uh, certain types of data. And as you can imagine, like with data localization, it's something that uh, is not so popular. So they have been uh, uh, clashback from, from different and stakeholders. And now, uh, as I understand, there have been um, an update on that draft policy. It's yet to be finalized, the, the, the updated version. It's le le yet to be released. But what we anticipate is we want to see this uh, revised uh, data and cloud policy to focus more on better regulation of foreign, uh, foreign owned um, infrastructure instead of indigenizing all existing infrastructures whilst also promoting our public-private partnerships. And the third point I also want to speak on, which also uh, supports this notion of AI sovereignty for Africa and for South Africa in particular, is the commitment towards us AI skills development. So there is, again, what we are getting uh, from, from going through the fragmented uh, policies is that um, South Africa is hoping to build its own uh, AI uh, pool of AI experts to research and develop AI-driven solutions to address some of the problems that it has. And um, there are different programs, starting from uh, basic primary education level all the way through to university levels, which are focusing on STEM subjects as well as AI-related um, uh, subjects. Of course, the question would be how long are are these initiatives going to be actually implemented? Most of them, they are still strategies and they are still plans that are yet to be actually implemented. So it's still a long process. And the last uh, point I also want to, 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 to point out is they still need to have an AI strategy. Uh, the country doesn't have a clear a a AI strategy or an AI policy, but um, I would uh, like to say or to, to think that it's important for countries to first prioritize, like Gibenga said, data protection issues before you rush to have an AI strategy or an AI policy or law in place. So starting from 
what are the low hanging fruits? We have data protection laws. Are they enough, adequate enough to address some of the data processing activities? Do we have cyber security, cyber crime laws? To what extent do they cover issues like deep fakes, if someone is going to commit a crime and they are using AI technologies, to what extent do the existing legal frameworks that we have, um, are they, are these uh, legal frameworks addressing some of these issues? And of course, um, just to, 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 to finalize, there are of course challenges that the country and other African countries are facing and likely to face in development of AI systems and even with data processing issue of power outages, unreliable power supply in South Africa. It's now a very um, big problem. Almost every day there are electrical um, outages and load shedding, and it's been uh, said that it's going to run for a period of two years. So imagine you need, you rely on electricity and already your uh, amount of time you spent online is going to be cut short because there is no electricity. So that's uh, also a challenge that the country is facing. The second challenge, I think it applies to all with other digital uh, projects, issue on meaningful connectivity. Yes, there have been a massive deployment of uh, different uh, digital infrastructures. Now we are moving to 4G and 5G, but still about 16 million people are still unconnected in the country. And then also the need again for stronger cyber security. So there are laws on cyber crime, there are laws on protection of critical infrastructure, but there is still no strategy specifically to deal with uh, cyber security. And also coming uh, the last point on implementation, of the laws that we have, especially data protection laws, there's always going to be that challenge that our data regulators will not have the capacity and even the expertise to understand some of the AI uh, tools that are in place to be in a position to actually assist with implementation and enforcement of the laws. So those thank are my Thank thoughts. you very thank much, you. Melody, and also for stressing the, how these issues are interconnected. And many of the most relevant ones are infrastructural issues. In particularly, I, I would like to stress something that you would mentioned about compute uh, and uh, cloud computing. Uh, there are actually three main corporations that have almost 70% of the cloud computing market, Google Cloud, uh, AWS, and Microsoft Azure then a little bit of Chinese corporation, a little bit of, of Huawei, and a little bit of, of uh, um, uh, Alibaba. But then basically the entire world relies on five corporations to do AI and generative AI. So that is, that is a, a huge challenge because even if you want to, if you want to uh, find an alternative, it, it's some, an investment that takes ages. It's 10 years investment in the best case scenario to have something minimally reliable and no government is in charge for 10 years <laughs> or has the vision to do something in 10 years. So it's, it's really something that uh, it, it is worth thinking about. Uh, all right, Let's, this is now the moment for the first break for questions. So we can take two questions and then we will uh, get into the second segment of the session. So if you have questions, uh, you could line uh, yes, you can raise your hand. Uh, you could, there is a mic there for a question. So if we can take two, uh, and we, we have a quick round of replies, and then we get into the second segment, then we will take more questions, and then we'll take more questions at the end, all right? So we have one there, and you, uh, you had, I, I see the two hands there. So if you, if you could use that mic and introduce, and explain, um, mention who you are, thank you very much. Um, hi, my name is Shuchi, I work, um, for Nationality for All, which is basically an organization that deals with nationality rights. Um, my background is not really in AI, which was why I was so interested in this conversation, because I really wanted to understand um, the question that this panel really proposes, whether it can, whether generative AI can be compatible with data protection. And I understand the challenges that we've all been speaking about, and those have been deeply insightful. But for the, for the second phase of this panel, um, I would be super interested to actually know if there are sort of frameworks or if there's any sort of um, ways that we actually have if this has basically worked in regions because, again, my background isn't in AI. So I, I was really curious to know because it's very in line with like statelessness and nationality. Right? Yes, in the second, be sure that in the second segment we will speak about this. 
So that was the quick reply to your question. So maybe if we, we can have another one, an extra one, if there is, this, this was very fast reply. <laughs> so you have another one, yes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pranav. I'm a technology law and policy professional. And uh, I also had the opportunity of contributing to this report with a paper on uh, generative AI thinking about privacy principles. And the gentleman, in the, the speaker also mentioned about why there is need to ensure data protection within Gen AI platforms. And my question is from the, everyone on the panel and in the room is, what are some of the key privacy principles at a normative level that should be ensured so that these Gen AI, which these Gen AI platforms can comply with? And I have uh, teased this question with identifying 17 of them in my paper. And my, this is just the first step to seek inputs at this global forum and then I would uh, like to test those principles by deploying it on uh, around 50 use cases and then make it better. So if, if at a normative level you have any ideas that these are some of the key principles that should definitely be there, that level of consensus building would be really helpful for our people. Thank you. Fantastic. And yes, uh, let me also mention that we have uh, 24 chapters here with almost 30 authors. So <laughs> given the, the, the time constraints and also space constraints, we were not able to have everyone, but we will have, we plan to have webinars where everyone can present and have feedback. Uh, if you want, no, anyone else who wanted to have, or Eva has an answer actually. <laughs> if you, or even if you want to, if we want to have a conversation here in this segment, so if anyone from the, the, the audience also want to give a reply, you are very welcome to, 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 to reply and then we will have feedback from the from this panel. Thanks a lot, uh, Luca, to, to give me the floor. Uh, and thanks to, to the previous speaker. Uh, first, I, I would like to thank you. It's very gle glad to, to hear from, uh, from the southern countries uh, the voice, and that's very important. Um, as we got the problem of uh, AI and data protection, that's a, a very big question, and I have worked uh, hardly on that problem. It is quite clear that AI put into question a certain number of principles, of data protection principles, and I, I would like to have you, you uh, feeling there about. First, the, the, the question of finality, question of uh, purpose. Normally, you must have a determinate purpose, and with a generative AI system, you have no more uh, the possibility to have a specified purpose. The second problem is the, the question of minimization. It is quite clear that it is totally <coughs> contrary uh, to the AI functioning. AI functioning is working on big data. You do not know a priori which kind of data will be uh, interesting and pertinent uh, for achieving new, uh, new uh, purpose. Another problem, and you have uh, mentioned that, is the problem of explainability. It is very difficult to, to make uh, an AI system explainable because it is quite clear that there is no logic. As Vincent said, uh, it is quite clear that you are working on a correlation and not on a certain logic, and so you have no logic at all. I have other problems, uh, but uh, we might come back on this issue. It is quite clear that as we got the problem of uh, personal data, it is quite clear that AI are working more and more on non-personal data, and they are using that for uh, profiling people. So it would be absolutely needed that data protection legislation will uh, enlarge its scope. That's quite clear. All right, these are very good questions. Do we have initial uh, replies from the panel? Yeah, uh, Melody, yes, you can go first. So looking at, um, looking at the protection of personal information <coughs> for South Africa, where it provides a framework to say when it comes to automated decision-making processes and for profiling, these are the conditions that have to be met. And then looking again at the basic data protection principles on transparency, data minimization, data subject rights, purpose limitation. It's, um, the principles are there, but I think application, that's where the problem is, because we, it's, it's much easier to say, okay, in this context, this is the principle on uh, processing of personal data. You need to know the purpose, you need to be very transparent, 
when it comes especially with facial recognition technologies, you need transparency, can data subject ex subjects exercise their rights? So in principle, in theory, the principles apply, but then when it comes to practice, and especially with generative AI, I think we have more questions, and that's why I was saying even with our data regulators, there is that lack of expertise from someone with more technical um, knowledge on how that actually the technical side of AI that can be translated into the legal side. So, in my opinion, there is more questions to that, than they, yeah, than there yeah. are answers. Ar Armando is an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't have, uh, like I said, like you said, yeah, there are many questions that are still to be solved, to be answered uh, regarding AI uses, but I think it applies to most systems regarding the use of data and uh, any system, depend on any platform, any technology, uh, its quality will depend on the quality of the data itself that the system has been fed on. And um, if we don't have, uh, as you said, the, the proper protections in place, and we don't have the uh, data that is properly collected and it's properly minimized, then the system will, of course, will do a, a profiling of, of the person, of the company, or the, or the subject itself in a way that doesn't necessarily translate into the realities or, the, or provide a solution for, uh, to solve a, a certain problem. So uh, in that case, uh, besides uh, having a strong data protection rules, there should be also strong data collection and data validation uh, regarding the quality of the data itself in order for, for, the, for AI or any system to provide uh, a proper solution or, uh, or, do we act, or actually of use of any help at all. And that's the, the, main, uh, the main challenge that we as a government has, especially in, in that part, in the developing nations, because uh, having data of good quality, good uh, administrative regi registers, is the it's the main the, is the main the main issue that we're facing right now. Just just to pro to provide to give to give this any use. Okay, this provides us a very good uh, segue to the second uh, segment of the session. So let me give the, the word to the regulator. Uh, we have Jonathan Mendoza, who is Secretary for Data Protection at the INAI, the National Institute for uh, Transparency, Access to Information, and Protection of Personal Data of Mexico. Please, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luca. Good afternoon. How are you? I want to thank the organizers uh, for bringing this topic to the table, especially Luca Belli, a leader in the Latin America region. Uh, data governance and trust has become a crucial topic, and we find ourselves at a critical juncture in the history of technological advancement. Artificial intelligence is rapidly evolving, offering boundless potential for innovation growth and improvement in our daily lives. But in the same way, we must also recognize the challenges it poses for its regulation, ethical use, and the importance of promoting AI transparency and accountability. In the Latin America region, steps have been taken toward regulating artificial intelligence. However, we must remember that the region is very diverse and has technological deficiencies that only allow access to technology for some sectors and groups of the population. Therefore, closing the digital crest is a primary task. Even though there are some exercises that are part of the efforts to regulate artificial intelligence, there needs to be a fully instrument dedicated entirely to it. In 2019, the members of authorities of the Ibero-American Data Protection Network issued general recommendations for processing personal data in artificial intelligence. Also in the region, it seems to be a trend closer to, to the ethical use of technology, but, but how could we ensure that algorithms are fair if they are not accessible to public scrutiny? How can we balance the ethical design and implementation of AI? Artificial intelligence can contribute enormously to the transformation of development models in Latin America and the Caribbean to make them more productive, inclusive, and sustainable. 
but to take advantage of its opportunities and minimize its potential threats. Reflection, strategic vision, regional and multilateral regulation and coordination is required. According to the first, to the first Latin America Artificial Intelligence Index in 2023, Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico are regional leaders in participation in international spaces to influence the global discussion on, N on AI. In the global context, according to the McKinsey Global Institute, the use and development of AI in multiple industries will bring mixed economic labor and labor results. 23 estimations of AI are 13 trillion US dollars will be the impact of AI in the global economy. 1.2% will be its contribution to the annual gross domestic product globally. 15.7 trillion US dollars will be the additional income to the global GDP. 45% of the benefits of AI will be the for financial, healthcare, and the automotive sector. As Chris Newman, Oracle's principal engineer said, as it becomes more difficult for humans to understand how AI tech works, it will be become harder to resolve ine inevitable problems. In our interconnected world, multi multilateralism plays a key role because AI knows no borders and international cooperation is not just beneficial but imperative. We must ensure that AI respects fundamental rights with a human-centric approach, abiding biases. The, the, paper, uh, the paper I co-authored with my colleagues Nadia Garbasio and Jesus Sanchez is a proposal to start a debate on, an, on AI in the Latin American region. We propose the creation of a dedicated mechanism that contributes to AI-related matters. Cooperation and strategic alliances with the Organization of American States will help us achieve this goal. To facilitate the implementation of this proposal, it is suitable to create a committee of experts that analyze and agrees on the importance and urgent need to contribute through non-binding mechanisms to the situation regarding the use and implementation of existing and yet to be developed disruptive te technologies given the risk they could imply in the private life of users. The objective of this committee of experts must be built on goodwill and on the exchange of knowledge and good practices that promote international cooperation based on multilateralism and the opportunities that it offers us to strengthen the protection of human rights, joining efforts with other international organizations that have also spoken out on the matter, as well as with groups of economic powers that have shown their concern about this panorama of the new digital age. The work of this committee will be based on a mechanism that will seek to analyze the specific cases, issue recommendations, provide follow-up, and develop cooperation tools. Let's be part of the conversation to maximize the benefits of AI for our societies while minimizing its potential risks. We must remain committed to fostering international cooperation as in strengthening these efforts to ensure that AI serves humanity's best interests. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And uh, also, let me also stress that INAI has been doing a lot of excellent work, both in terms of po ten ten attempts to po of policy experimentation and international cooperation in trying to put forward some recommendations on how to work, to, to work and regulate with generative AI. Uh, staying in the Latin American region, I would like to ask Camila, that uh, has also been one of the uh, minds behind the construction of this group since uh, April, to provide us a quick uh, overview of what's happening in Brazil. Perfect. Thank you so much, Luca, for the invitation, for the creation of the group, for uh, all the amazing job that you do in FTV, and also a pleasure to be here with you. Considering that I'm from Brazil and also from a consumer organization in Brazil, I would like to focus on that. We are talking about data privacy, but as Melody mentioned, we are not only talking about data privacy, we have several other rights that we have to consider. So I'm going to talk fast about the general risks that we, we can talk when, when uh, facing the challenges of generative AI. Second, about the laws that might interconnect on that, focusing on data protection, but also on consumer protection. 
and also talk a little about the Brazilian context um, in terms of legislation and ways ahead too. Um, AI has lots of possibilities and for example, EDAC works in financial services, in mobility services, in uh, health, and all these areas can benefit from general AI and uh, from AI and generative AI. But as we can see, it's it has two sides. We have both an opportunity and a challenge on dealing with that, especially because innovation goes in a speed that regulation does not follow. So that is why it's important also to think about current legislations that have to be, be applied when, uh, when we are facing that. Some general risks that you are tired to hear, like we have issues related to power, we have issues related to wrong outputs, on the use of this technology to manipulate people, on bias, discrimination, privacy, vulnerabilities. And we also have a challenge, and here coming from a Global South country, and it's a table of Global South in here, which is dependence. So we are talking about how to protect people from that, and we rely on other countries, on other technologies, and how we can do that, uh, how, how can we build the, the sufficient power on that? So it's a great challenge that obviously I don't have an answer, but I hope that we can, we can build on that. Also, one important thing is the techno-solutionism that this, um, this kind of technology bring, because uh, when, when we do that, we, uh, we disregard the, the context, and that, that is the reason that I want to talk more about Brazil. But before talking about Brazil and the different laws, I would also like to bring the issue of concentration of power. Once we are talking about generative AI, of course we think about ChatGPT, but we are not only talking about ChatGPT. We depend not only on foreign companies when we are talking about the global south, but rely on big techs. And we know that these big techs can bring lots of solutions, but lots of abuse considering that they dominate the market. So that is why it is important to consider not only data protection law that of course is extremely necessary, but also consumer law to protect people in the end. We are putting put people in the center and these people are, are also consumers, we are all consumers. And competition law also to face that. So first law that is important that we have to comply and its existence and we have to enforce that is competition law. The second one is data protection, as we are mentioning. And to develop on that, I will talk about a case in Brazil that was brought by a really known organization in Brazil, which is <laughs> really known person in Brazil, which is Luca Belli, <laughs> uh, uh, about this. And third of all, also consumer rights have to be respected. We are talking about transparency. We are talking about access to information, which is basically consumer traditional rights. Beyond that, we have also IP, IP law, of course, um, copyright, um, but I'm going to, to focus on that. Okay, uh, talking about Brazil. Brazil is a huge market, not only in terms of market in general, but also on AI. So Brazil is the fourth country on the use of ChatGPT. So it's a concern that we have to, to consider on that. And since, it's a, it, since it is a concern, I'm going to spend a little more time talking about the petition that was presented to the Data Protection Authority in Brazil by Luca uh, about, um, about uh, not complying with uh, the data protection law in Brazil uh, of ChatGPT not complying on the law. I'm gonna focus on the um, on the rights that the that was that was requested on this petition, which is to know the identity of the controller of the data. This is a minimum thing to know. The second one is to access all the personal data that have respect to the person that is affected. So this is about self-determination. Self and as Luca mentioned, this is not only data protection right, but this is a human right in the end. The third one is the right to have uh, access to clear and adequate information on the criteria and the procedures used on the formulation of the automatic response. These three topics uh, can, uh, Luca brought it, but everyone is affected by that, not only in Brazil, but also other countries. And also, this, this kind of complaint could ha have been brought also by the consumer authority, because we are talking about access to information in the end. So this is a provocation also for you, like, 
we, we have to think on how we can advance on that, not only in Brazil, but other countries. Unfortunately, I have some bad news that the Data Protection Authority didn't go forward with this, this process, which I think it, it's not only sad, but it's an absurd. Um, and I hope that we can, the, the authority can advance on that because it's an important issue. But nowadays, the Data Protection uh, Authority is bringing a consultation on sandbox of AI. But when we bring cases like this, when Luca bring a case like this, they don't advance on that. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, a second context that um, Jonathan also brought. Let me just ask you to wrap up in one okay. minute. Okay, just one minute. Uh, the um, the network of authorities in um, in the Iberian American region also is focusing on the ChatGPT issues of legal hypothesis, exer exercise of rights, and transfers of data, which is interesting because uh, the Data Protection Authority in Brazil is also present on that. Um, we have to comply with existing laws, but we can also advance on future frameworks, as, as you were mentioning. So um, in Brazil, we have a bill also on that, and we hope to advance on that. But meanwhile, we, ha we have to comply with existing laws. Thank you. Sorry for extending, Luca. Thank you very much. And, and just a, a very brief comment, because that case that uh, she was mentioning that concerns me personally, it's, it's very also frustrating to say that even when there are laws in place and rights in place, when there are, every law has needs to have elements of flexibility, not to, uh, not to, to be able not to regulate technology in a way that is too strict and, ad and allow the advancement of technology. But when there are clauses of flexibility, like what is an adequate information about how your data are processed, or what is an adequate information about the criteria according to which your data are utilized to train models, that is the moment where the regulator has to enter into the game. Because adequate, anything is, adequate is the favorite word of lawyers together with reasonable. <laughs> because you can charge hefty <laughs> prices and fees to your clients to debate what is adequate or reasonable. But that the, the, the role of the regulator is precisely to say to, the, to, 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 uh, to enterprises, to people, what is adequate and what is reasonable. And it's a little bit frustrating when the regulator don't do it. And they find also that some very curious practices of data scraping by some corporations are may be considered as adequate or reasonable because those are very hard to believe and to think as ra reasonable and adequate practices. Anyway, not to get into very personal matters, <laughs> let's get, uh, I, I would like to, to ask if the, our uh, online panelists are online, can you hear us? I would like to, to ask if Wei Wang is connected. Wei, can you hear us? Sure. Okay, sure, so actually we have an example of where generative AI has actually already been regulated, China, that has uh, just issued uh, some specific recommendations on it. And so it's quite interesting to understand uh, what is the, 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 uh, what is the situation in China with regard to regulation of generative AI and data protection. So please, Wei, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Luca, as always, and uh, thank you for having me today, at least virtually. Yes, and it's very cool to meet quite a few new and uh, old friends, at least virtually. Uh, yes, and um, as per, our, as per the, uh, the content of our report, I, I think I, I'm supposed to share some Asia perspect uh, perspectives on regulating artificial intelligence in the first place. Since I came back from Latin America to Asia, yes, I have attended uh, quite a few events, both online and in person. Uh, I happen to find that quite a few, I mean, Asia jurisdictions are cautious in regulating AI. And they prefer to let uh, ethical frameworks uh, go first rather than making hard law come first. Um, and uh, they pre also prefer minor steps or what we call precise regulation. For example, in Singapore, the governance model uh, prefers a light uh, touch and a voluntary regulatory approach uh, for AI. Uh, basically, it aims to use AI as a tool for economic growth and improve in the, uh, and, uh, proving quality of life. And, but they also uh, acknowledge that uh, Singapore might have to adopt to um, existing global frameworks instead of creating new regulations in isolation. So this is sort of, I mean, globalist uh, perception. 
uh, distinguishing those Asia to restriction from others like EU, Brazil, UK, and the United States. Uh, the EU always, I, I think, as all of us know, uh, EU and Brazil are adopting comprehensive acts or views. Uh, the UK model is based on a pro-innovation idea so far, at least, uh, while the United States seems to stick to the liberal market idea uh, still. Uh, by contract, China has a sector-specific approach instead, for, in, for instance, in the areas of recommendation, algorithms, defenses, technology, and generative AI, as Luca has mentioned. So, as some uh, from the FPF, I mean, the future private foreign argued that data protection authorities are becoming sort of default regulators for AI in this time gap. Uh, in the case of China, the PIPO, its Personal Information Protection Law, has uh, articles for example, 24, 27, and 55. They are clearly relevant to regulating automated decision making under official regulation. Under the newly established insurance uh, measures on generative AI, basically highlights the importance of ensuring the use of data and the underlying models from legitimate sources in compliance with the relevant laws and the regulations as regards uh, IP and the data protection. Um, but uh, anyway, but things are, it seems, are becoming, I mean, uh, more interesting as, uh, as quite a few jurisdictions are considering a big change in this sort of regulatory model, for example, in both uh, states and China. As you may be already aware of, uh, the recent proposed uh, bipartisan framework for USA Act advocates for a regulatory focused on legal accountability and consumer protection proposing a licensing regime administered by an autonomous oversight entity. Similarly, in China, a research group from the Chinese Academy of Social Science, of which I'm currently an invited member as well, drafted a model AI law proposing a negative, least-based, and risk-based approach to governing AI. There are some similarities with the EU AI Act, but there are also some nonsense as well. Uh, but, but uh, I mean, generally, the uh, model law introduced uh, the principle of accountability, categorizing the entities along the AI value chain and assigning duties or responsibility in terms of retention, disclosure, and a manual assistance of data disclosure or data sharing uh, with an institutional uh, intent uh, of fostering a transparent AI system. That being said, some of the jurisdictional perspectives are reaching a consensus as regards to AI governance, but this also requires more continued comparative studies, for example, about more uh, global south approaches. Uh, those new developments basically highlight the uh, response of jurisdiction to address those challenges uh, uh, of AI uh, with the focus on accountability principles or tailored uh, obligations under proactive technology design, even as probably uh, uh, Camilla mentioned that the techno solutionism. But it's still essential to seek an implementable or op op operationalizable, as I've mentioned in our chapter, um, uh, sort of op operationalizable accountability requiring a sort of long balance between adaptability and the regulatory predict predictability to ensure effective and end uh, governance within the dynamic AI landscape. Uh, we, we will definitely keep com uh, coming across the question of uh, regulation versus uh, innovation. And I think our DC is a per perfect place to achieve this goal, I believe. So in this regard, I look very much forward to continuing the collaboration within and beyond the group in the near future. Okay, I think that's all from me today. Thank you for having me here virtually today. Uh, yes, I will hand it back to you, Luca. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Wei. And actually, now we have uh, is this is a good segue to enter into the uh, last uh, speaker of this segment, uh, the Smriti Parshira from India. Uh, Smriti, can you can you hear us? Smriti, are you connected? Yes, I can Excellent. hear you. Can you? Hear Yes, so Smriti can bring us a little bit of, is going to broaden a little bit our uh, perspective with uh, co some concrete uh, cases from India, and then we can expand on this in the last segment. Please, Smriti, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Luca, and hello to everyone in the room and online. Uh, so as Luca mentioned, I'm going to really be a little broader than uh, the topic which is suggested, which is more specific to generative AI. And uh, my intervention in this book talks about the question of transparency and the interpretation of what 
really transparency should mean in the AI context. And you know, this is a term which is well regarded now, well accepted in most AI strategies. India also has an AI strategy and it talks about the principle of transparency among others. It's also a principle that's reflected in different ways in data protection law. So India very recently has adopted its data protection law and the, the philosophy of transparency does come about when you think about you know processes like notice and consent, access to information, correction, redress facilities. So all of this does speak in some way to transparency and very often in the AI context, transparency is connected with explainability and accountability. And what I do in this intervention is really I say that when we often think about transparency in the AI context, it's uh, often the tools or even the discussions are very much about the technical side of transparency. So it's about algorithmic transparency, transparency of the model itself, but the paper argues that we really need to step back and take a broader lens because we know that there are a number of actors who are involved typically in any AI implementation and therefore transparency like every other principle you see in AI principles should permeate through the entire life cycle of the project and in this paper I specifically identify three layers and this is mostly in the context of you know, large-scale public-facing applications. And I take the case study of uh, one such application in India in the context of uh, facial recognition systems for entry into airports, which is you know, something which is being seen across the world. In many other countries, you see similar systems. And the, uh, the argument of the paper is that you know, there are at least three layers of transparency that you need to think about. The first is policy transparency. So it's about how did this project come about? Is there a law backing it? Who are the actors involved? Which government department ministries took this decision? Through what open and deliberative process? The second is about technical transparency, more you know, well understood questions about uh, transparency of the model, what kind of data was used, who designed the code, uh, you know, what does the code do, how well does it work, etc. And the third is about operational and organizational transparency, which is really about which is the entity which is finally giving effect to this. Uh, how does the system work on the day-to-day -day basis? What are the kind of failures that you're seeing? What is the kind of accountability mechanisms that exist for this entity? And who exactly is it answerable to? Is it answerable to the parliament, to the public? Like, what are the mechanisms for transparency within this body? And then I apply this, uh, you know, in the paper. I'm not going to go into great detail due to paucity of time into uh, the findings, but there are three... Uh, you know, broad observations that I make. One is that uh, transparency in the policy sense cannot just be about imparting information to the public about the existence of such systems. It has to be a bit more deliberative about, you know, why we are bringing this, should we bring this in the first place, etc. cetera. Um, the second point is about, you know, there is a culture of third parties working with the government, either as philanthropies, as think tanks, as consultants. There is the need for transparency, not just about who developed the code and whether we were transparent in the procurement process, but even how did these ideas come about and there is need for transparency, you know, at a deeper level. And finally, tools of transparency. Very often, if you have entities outside of the government, public, private sector, non-profit bodies running these systems, then will the, you know, tools of transparency, which are in the form of right to information laws, for instance, in India, apply to these entities? And we see in this particular case study, which I study here, that the design does not enable the application of you know, transparency and public disclosure, which a public body would be faced with in this particular structure. So uh, I'll stop with that. And people in the room, I would love to hear your comments if you have a chance to read the paper later. Thank you, Luca. Fantastic, Smriti. Uh, now, we have to, do, to have a, a series of actions in the next five to 10 minutes, because we will have the possibility for participants to ask questions. At the same time, we will have the speakers of the initial two rounds that will move to the, uh, the first row of chairs, and the speakers of the last round that will move to the, this part of the table, because for organizational purposes, we have to, speakers have to be here. So if you have questions in the room, please, this is the moment for you to ask questions using the mic there. We have questions from, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. So I'll, let me also thank uh, Shilpa Singh, that is uh, our remote moderator. And uh, you can take the mic and ask the question from the online uh, participants. Uh, there is a question from Mr. Amir Mukaberi. He's from Iran. And uh, his question is that, could shaping the UN Convention on artificial intelligence help to manage its risk and misuse at international level? Do geopolitical conflicts and strategic competition between AI powers allow this? 
What is the role of IGF in this regard? That's a very, uh, very open question. Uh, I don't know if the, pan the new set of panelists has uh, any uh, any uh, ideas on this. Uh, my personal take is that uh, it will take a, l a lot, a lot of time before I have international agreement on any international regime on AI, and that is precisely the reason why many uh, tech executives, uh, or at least some of them, may be advocating for having an international regime because they know very well it would take and between seven and ten years to be developed and maybe start being l l slightly meaningful. So it's, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if, you ha if we have other opinions here in the panel on uh, international uh, organization. I think, I think actually this is a very good uh, connection with uh, Michael Karanikola's paper because he's really, actually coincidentally, he's the first speaker of this last slot and coincidentally he has r written an excellent chapter in this book about this, exactly this topic. So Michael, no one better than you can uh, reply to this and start presenting your paper, please. Thank you, uh, and I'll start by echoing uh, the other panelists and, and, and thank you, thanking Luca. I'm amazed at how quickly this has come together and what's in, with such a, a great group of authors. Um, so my paper focuses on emerging transatlantic frameworks for AI that are being developed under the auspices of a handful of powerful regulatory blocks, namely the US, the EU, and, and China, and examines the implication of this trend for um, the emerging AI governance uh, landscape. I'm gonna have to go through this very quickly, so I won't go too deeply into the paper. Um, but just in, in response to, to the question about um, the uh, potential UN framework, um, I discussed the OECD framework as well as, as, as these different, different uh, uh, um, structures. And I think there's a, there's a broader tension um, between the value and benefits and efficiencies of harmonization, right, and um, the, the tendencies uh, of harmonized standards, whether it's at the UN level um, or the Brussels effect or the California effect or, or, or whatever, um, to uh, trample over important local contexts, not only in terms of um, the needs of populations being impacted uh, uh, by AI, but also in terms of how, at a more basic level, how harms are framed and the assumptions and prioritizations uh, that are inherent in any legislative framework. And um, I, I argue in my paper that, you know, there, there, is, a, there is a challenge um, in terms of um, trying to develop a harmonized structure um, that, that it's going to fail to uh, take into account um, diverse populations, um, particularly when um, the people that tend to have a seat at the table in the early development of these standards tend to be from um, wealthier, wealthier uh, parts of the world. Um, so I, I, I explore that tension. I, I think that it's, um, I'll caution by saying that it, it's, it can also be overly reductionist to view this dynamic uh, purely in, in global north and global so south um, terms, that there are um, a lot of different dimensions to this. Um, but ultimately, um, I, you know, I say that as, as frameworks um, begin to coalesce into transnational standards, it's important to uh, query whether they actually represent the needs and concerns of those on the sharpest edge of technological disruption um, and whether um, the development of these standards and the harmonization of these standards uh, is, uh, has the potential to further entrench uh, inequities on a global scale. So that's a two minute version of my paper. And uh, I'm happy to chat further if folks have questions. Fantastic, Michael, also for actually having provided both a reply to the question and the presentation of your paper. Uh, I, I guess you have also a question. Yes, so I think we, we, can, we can do this. We can take this question and then go through the presentation, and then it will be the first question to be replied at the end of the, of the presentation. Okay, yes, please go ahead. I want, just wanted to build on what Michael just said. Uh, my name is Michael Nelson. I work at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington. And one of my colleagues is Annie Bradford, who wrote the book, The Brussels Effect, and now has a new book on digital empires that covers some of the same territory. I, I look forward to spending more than two minutes with your ideas. Annie and I have a friendly debate about whether the Brussels effect sometimes becomes the Brussels defect. <laughs> one part of it is, is what you just said. Other countries are taking European language designed for European legal system and putting it in a place where it doesn't really work. But a more important problem, particularly with the AI Act, is 
they're writing law that's, I think, way too premature. They, they, they haven't even really got a definition of what is AI. Uh, I'm a physicist, I'm not a lawyer, but when I was working on Capitol Hill, the first thing we did was get the definitions right. Not just defining what you're regulating so you can have a box, but defining what you're not gonna regulate. So I guess my question for anybody who wants to take it is, how do we avoid this problem of imposing these aspirational goals on a vague field of technology that will be totally different in 18 months? Th thank you very much, Michael, for this excellent comment. Uh, as we have started with 10 minutes of delay, we might have a margin of 10 minutes at the end because I saw already a, uh, yes. Uh, so we can rush with the uh, last round of very quick presentations. So the next one will be Kamesh Shikar. Um, thank you so much, uh, Luca. And um, so, yeah, so I guess like we have like very few like, you know, like time to like, you know, rush through the paper, but um, like, uh, my our intervention our, our chapter like um, talks a little bit or answers some of the questions that like the first panel spoke about also so like i'll very briefly touch upon the three things that we do in our paper and like what's the background to that um like as we all know that like there is already a lot of buzz around like you know the uncertainty over like the AI uh, regulations and like AI technologies itself. And like just a response to that, we still see a lot of frameworks happening at the various levels, right? Like, you know, you just strategy documents and like legislations cropping in here and there. But um, like one question, very important question that we try to like answer through our chapter is that, okay, tomorrow we bring a framework and we say that AI developers have to follow certain amount of principles. Will everything become fine? Right, and that's where our paper comes in and asks, what about AI deployers? What about impact population who also interface with the technology at this moment, right? So AI technology used to be B2B, but now it's also B2C with generative AI technologies where like we also interface with it and use it. So it's the specific, that's this very specific question that we try to ponder over and like, you know, suggest a framework called as a principle-based framework at the ecosystem level where, you know, various responsibilities are divided across like various stakeholders within the ecosystem such that like, you know, collectively or collaboratively, we can make the entire ecosystem of artificial intelligence utilization safer and responsible. So how we went about doing this is that first thing is um, we try to like map the impact and harm across the AI life cycle. At the different stages, um, let me give you an example and that makes it very clearer. Exclusion, okay? So if we talk about exclusion as the you know end impact of like whatever is happening, ad adverse implication, it just doesn't happen because like one particular aspect has gone wrong. There are various aspects which come like you know come together at the different stages of the you know AI life cycle. And across this AI life cycle, we all know that there are different players involved. So all of these like you know um, yeah, implications come together and make the exclusion happen. So we went about like actually like you know mapping that, and this also answers like you know kind of resonates with Melody's point on like what is the liability, where the liability or the responsibility is, like you know lies with, right? Like we need to understand who and what they do. Uh, after doing this, obviously the organic progression is like what's the principles that everybody has to follow, and this also also answers somebody's question from the online is that like the consensus building in principles. We have a lot of principles available out there on AI, right? So, but we need to now start having a conversation. Hey, you have those principles, and I also think that this is the principle I resonate with. So, I think that's the you know starting point. Uh, maybe that's an answer to the question. Also, starting for point for like at the internet level everybody coming together and like you know discussing about something you know collaborative and like um, you know legitimate for the international level um, so we map all the principles and then like the third point point is like operationalization which is was also like spoken um, in operationalization like what we went about doing is that like very specific you know gap that we are trying to fill is bring out the differences in the principle at the different like you know stages 
and show that like, hey, when we talk about giving an example again, like hu human in the loop as a principle, we keep talking about it. But at the operationalization level, when we come to planning to designing stage, human in the loop means differently. Right, like it means you have to engage with the stakeholders, or like you know you have to bring the impact population into the room and etc. and stuff. But same principle means differently at the like you know other levels. So that is what the difference that we bring. Thirdly, um, you know, final point like before I conclude is that is also now it's the impact we map the principles operationalization and also now it's implementation right and that goes ultimately to your governments so there what we try to do is that like you know look at a little bit from also like somebody mentioned um, the last speaker mentioned that like you know there is a market in brazil for generative ai that's the case for any developing country so we need to balance that approach and see like not necessarily regulation has to be you know compliance based right like it can also be market based how can we enable the market so we are trying to like look in that way and like how to operationalize this framework into that market based mechanism where there is a value proposition which the you know businesses see so this is what like we do in the paper yeah fantastic. i can take more fantastic and yeah. one more time let me thank all the last uh, uh, set of panelists for being very concise because i know that we have time constraints and i know that our tech support they are so kind to give us five or ten extra minutes to finalize and uh, so let me give the floor now to uh, Kazim Rizvi for his present very short presentation thank you thank you, thank you so much uh, so I think just moving on from what <coughs> Kamesh was talking about and uh, you know we have two papers as part of this brief and the second paper actually looks at you know mapping and operationalization of trustworthy AI principles. So while what we are doing, uh, what Kamesh is saying in terms of the first paper is to sort of just come up with all the principles, here we are sort of looking at certain sectors where we have to sort of look at understanding the synergies and conflicts with respect to these AI principles and how they'll play out. So what we try to do over here is basically look at two areas. One is the finance and finance sector and the second is a healthcare sector. Uh, and for these two sectors, we've sort of come up with certain principles which we believe are critical for operationalization and to make sure that you know you are deploying trustworthy principles on the ground. So the paper has adopted an approach where it has looked at the technical and non-technical layer of AI. Uh, within the technical layer, uh, layer, there is basically, you know, we're looking at different implementation solutions uh, and how do you integrate these solutions with the responsible AI framework which we are developing. And the non-technical layer is basically, you know, imp sort of exploring strategies uh, to sort of look at, you know, responsible implementation and ethical uh, directions, et cetera. Uh, and all of this has been done through a multi-stakeholder approach. So we've advocated for a multi-stakeholder approach towards uh, map mapping and operationalization of AI principles. I think that's something which we've been very clear about uh, because we believe that you know you need different set of stakeholders. You need the industry, the civil society, the academia, the government, etc., to sort of come up and look at how these principles will be operationalized for these two particular sectors. So we've spoken to experts in these sectors. We will also be sort of looking at uh, certain uh, discussions and see if, if, if some of these principles can be implemented effectively. Uh, and also to look at uh, domestic coordination of regulation. Uh, so what we've also uh, identified are that AI, there is no specific act or law which governs AI in India. Uh, so we have tried to come up with uh, some sort of principles where you have the privacy law, you have uh, IT law which regulates the internet, you have different other laws which are coming up. Um, how, do you, how do they all work together and how do they harmonize with each other with respect to regulation of AI in the future? So at one level we are talking about domestic coordination. Uh, we are not saying that, look, you have to regulate it uh, sort of very stringently, but existing internet laws how can they be harmonized? And the second is around uh, international coordination. And I think that's where even previously what Kamesh was talking about, and this is something which we've looked at is uh, at a global level, can we come up with some sort of models or frameworks to identify implementation? And then looking at these two sectors, healthcare, what is required, what are the 
pr principles which are key for healthcare, which may not be necessary for finance sector. So that kind of mapping and you know operationalization is what we are doing right now. And then we're also sort of looking at alternative regulatory approaches. Okay, so you know we are talking about um, you know market mechanisms, private public partnerships, uh, you know e even looking at consumer protection within the developers, uh, and you know how do we ensure safety, etc. So I think that's something which we've looked at as well. Uh, and the idea is to look at uh, deployment and implementation and testing it with one of these two sectors. So, so the technical uh, support is telling me that we have to move fast without breaking things. <laughs> and so we uh, let me pass the floor to our the first uh, last two speakers that will very fast uh, expose their brilliant papers. So Claudio Chico, you have a presentation. We have a very last presentation and then a very last uh, other presentation. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if we can have this on online, can we have the presentation? Or maybe in the, in the interest of time, let me, yes, we have the presentation, excellent. So, konnichiwa to everyone, and uh, thank you, Mr. <laughs> and thank you, uh, Professor Belli, for the introduction. I will uh, very quickly dive deep into the relationship between uh, artificial intelligence and uh, corporate governance, because as we uh, all can see, uh, artificial intelligence is reshaping the, uh, our social, economical, and political environment, but also the corporate governance framework and the business processes are being affected by this technological revolution. Indeed, uh, we are hearing about, uh, for example, an appointment of artificial intelligence as, uh, art, uh, as uh, directors that, uh, legally speaking, uh, I uh, really uh, doubt about it, but it's happening in this time. So um, I'm the feeling, I have the feeling that uh, we are um, going toward a new form of corporate governance that I have uh, labeled as a computational corporate governance model where uh, artificial intelligence um, is uh, an auxiliary instrument or can maybe substitute the directors in the main um, function of uh, corporate governance uh, bodies, like, uh, for example, strategy setting, decision making, monitoring, and compliance. So what I have, uh, uh, I have a put a question to myself. We are going toward a technologization of the human being. I'm afraid of uh, it. So, uh, as we know, we have a lot of problems in this uh, kind of revolution. For example, the main problems that I'm working on uh, in my paper uh, is about the transparency and the, the accountability problems. And uh, uh, so, for this reason, I tried to uh, create a framework to allow the corporate uh, corporation to implement artificial intelligence in an ethical way. Uh, in the corporate governance and business processes. My proposal that I uh, named AI by Corporate Design Framework is grounded on uh, the business process management, the field of management that can allow to analyze, to improve the processes in uh, uh, the corporation, and uh, it is just posed with the uh, AI life cycle, and I divided both of them in seven steps to combine them and uh, to uh, control artificial intelligence and uh, um, enhance the uh, principle of human in the loop and human on the loop. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this model is also grounded in a human right, a global AI uh, framework. It is based also in a privacy by design principle that uh, uh, states that is better prevent that than react. Under the uh, corporate governance, and quickly I'm going to conclude, uh, I propose a creation of a new committee, the Ethical Algorithmic Legal Committee, composed by a mix of uh, uh, professionists, like, for example, not only directors, but uh, consultant that can act as a filter between the uh, stakeholder and the output of the uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, also, I conclude with uh, um, asking not only to myself, but also to you, if it's not uh, 
the case uh, that uh, uh, the legislators uh, start to think uh, about a technology as a, a corporate dimension, uh, as happened in Italy, for example, with reference to accountability, organization, administration. My answer is yes, I think that is the time. Thank you. Fantastic, and thank you very much for doing this excellent and detailed presentation in literally three minutes. Excellent. <laughs> so we have now the final one. The one by Lisa, the last but of course not least. Please, Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Lisa Janssens and I will very shortly uh, explain uh, where I am from because that's also connected to the paper that I have written. Um, I'm an sci a scientist uh, at the Department of Military Operations uh, at the Dutch Applied Sciences Institute. And I have a background in law and philosophy. And I combine those two disciplines at, uh, in my projects. And I work together with mathematicians, engineers. And I'm very proud to say that because it's very difficult to work actually interdisciplinary together. So my job at the Institute, I'm now there for my seventh year. And since two years, it actually works out to work together. And uh, how I'm doing that, uh, I, I, uh, I, I, um, I found a way how to work together. So scenario planning, scenarios, military theater scenarios can be a platform that you meet each other from different disciplines. You stay on your own discipline, but you can meet each other in one focus point of problems and how to solve problems from the technical point of view and how to connect those uh, two for example, rule of law mechanisms, because I am trying to seek for new requirements from the, um, from the point of view of uh, rule of law tenets, because we can find uh, an agreement in, within the United Nations, but also in the European Union and also in the USA, that the rule of law matters and is very important to adhere to. So the rule of law for me is about good governance. And if I connect it to AI, it's about good governance of AI. How do we do that? So I am looking for new technical requirements informed from multiple disciplines, law, philosophy, and technology. And I found a way how to work together. And that is a, a scenario that is like a very good informed operational scenario. And you can even test the new requirements, for example, that's very ambitious, but we are going to try to do that in a NATO project uh, via digital twins, uh, or even maybe a real uh, setting, uh, an operational test environment. Um, thank you. Fantastic. Fantastic. And so now, as everyone has been so, uh, so uh, patient to stay here until the end of the day, uh, it's uh, 6.36, so you all deserve a free complimentary copy of the book. <laughs> and uh, the first that will run here will deserve it. The, <laughs> the other ones will have a, a free access PDF that you can download already on the page uh, of the page of the Data and AI Governance Coalition. I repeat, that you, also, you can also use the mini URL bit.ly slash dig 23 or die 2023, you have both. You can use the form to give us feedback. You can speak with us now to give us, feed us feedback. You can, we can have a drink now together <laughs> so that we can give us feedback. All feedback is very welcome. And thank you very much. Uh, really, thank you very much, especially to the, I don't want to diminish the importance of the first two set of panelists, but this uh, uh, last one has been fantastic. And thank you a lot to the technical teams. You are, you are excellent and you have done tremendous work. Thank you very much.